Identification. Learning to identify. This is a real challenge. Now, it's not too difficult if somebody's like you. The real challenge is to identify with somebody who's not like you. In a wider range of teaching all of this, here's the reaction you want from identification. Me too. You just want the reaction for somebody to say, me too, I understand what that's like. I've been there. So part of it is trying to translate your experiences into words so that someone will identify with it and say, me too. Here's the reaction you don't want. So what? <laughs> now, it's easy if you're not careful to load your presentation with a lot of so what's. Mr. Schoff, who only went to the eighth grade in school, but he gave me the classic point to ponder here when I was 25 years old. And it was put in such simple terms, I've never forgotten it. Let me put it in those same terms for you. Here's what he said. Learn to express, not impress. That was so helpful for me. Because it's easy to engage in language just designed to impress instead of express. But Schoff said, if you want to touch somebody, learn to express. Sincerity from the heart. Not impress. Impress builds a gulf. Express builds a bridge. Identification. This is a whole wide subject in itself. The identification question is, what will make me real to my audience? What will make me real to the child? Identification is building a bridge. If you're meeting somebody for the first time, it's simply getting acquainted. Building a bridge, making contact. Here's one of the clues. Find something you have in common. That's where you start, something you have in common. At our ranch up at Clear Lake, when we have seminars, everybody gets acquainted real easy. And one of the reasons is because almost everybody gets lost trying to find it. <laughs> right? What a great way, right? Did you get as lost as I did trying to find this place? <laughs> right? Somebody says, yeah, was that you up there taking the wrong turn? I thought that was you. What a great way to get acquainted. We've just had an experience recently that's been similar, like getting lost. So identification is finding something in common. Here's the clue to really affecting people. Start with where they are before you try to take them to where you want them to go. Meet people where they are. If somebody's hurting, you've got to meet in the hurt. If somebody's in trouble, you've got to start with the trouble. One of the greatest communicators of all time, Paul, apostle of early Christian history, didn't have any problem talking to sinners because he claimed to be chief sinner. Wow, what an identification point. Do you think sinners would listen to chief sinner? Of course. <laughs> He said, tell me about being a sinner. I'm number one sinner. Got the plaque on the wall. <laughs> what a way to begin, right, if he's talking to sinners. The key is to start where somebody is. If they're in trouble, you've got to start with trouble. You can't talk success if somebody's in trouble. You've got to start, first of all, talking trouble. Now, if you've never been in trouble, you've got a problem. So, I suggest here that you get in a little trouble. So you know how to talk trouble. So that when somebody is stricken in the heart, and you've had this experience, maybe not as deeply, but somewhat of an experience of being stricken in the heart, when you meet somebody and you're trying to help them, you can talk about being stricken in the heart, and it'll have substance, it'll have meaning, it'll have depth. And you start there, and then start building the bridge, and start building the path towards solving the problem. Identification. How do you identify with a child? It's tough. What if the adult is 40 and the child is 12? We call that a long bridge. How do you bridge the gap between 40 and 12? It isn't easy. In fact, we used to call it the generation gap. And how do you manage the skills that builds the bridge over the generation gap? Well, there's some answers here. Here's number one. Remember when you were 12. You've just got to have the skill to go back. This is what an actor does. They go back. They rehearse the early hurts and emotions, the trauma and the drama of the sum total of their life and back in the early years. you just got to go back through all that and let it affect you one more time. Let it wash over you one more time. Let it rekindle one more time. You say, well, it may be painful. That's true, but you've got to go back through these pains in order to reach some people that are in pain. So part of it is to remember when you were 12. I don't have much problem with 12-year-olds because I remember almost every day of being 12. 12 is a fascinating year. One of the challenges of being 12 is you're not 13. If I heard it once, I heard it 100 times when I was 12. You're only 
12, as if that was some awful place to be, right? The teenagers would say, of course you can't go, you're only 12. I thought, wow, I can't wait to be rid of 12 and become a teenager. So, pretty frustrating. You just got to go back and remember that. If you want to reach somebody 12, you just got to remember 12. Did you ever get chosen last when you were a kid? That's an awesome experience. They're choosing up sides. I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you. And then you're last and you're standing there. And the next leader says, well, I guess I'll have to take you. Right? <laughs> wow, what an awesome experience. But you just got to go back and relive that. Let it smite you one more time. Let it hit you and let it hurt you. Because, see, to really affect people, you've got to be moved. And you've got to be touched. And without moving and touching of life experiences, whatever emotion it calls for, there are some people you can't reach. Here's another key way to reach the kids. Read all their books. Here's what it's called. Do your homework. Lack of homework shows in the marketplace. Lack of homework shows at home. See, if a child has read this book and I read the book, one of the great places we can meet is in the book. I say to the child, remember the story where right away they're going to be impressed that I've done my homework. And the kid says, did you read that book? I said, yes, I read all those books. They say, wow. But I say, remember the story where? They say, I remember that story. I say, well, that's about like now. Not exactly, but it's pretty close. And the child says, oh, I see, I see. Now they can see because we went back to the common seeing that was in the book. But if you miss the book and don't do your homework, I'm telling you, you'll miss a chance to identify. Here's the big challenge, identifying with somebody who's not like you in color or religion or circumstance. How do the successful reach and touch somebody who isn't successful? Well, first of all, they've got to talk about their struggle, not their success. Let me give you the clue to good identification. Your struggle will more often identify than your success. If you've got an hour to talk and you spend 59 minutes on your success story, we call that building a gulf, not a bridge. You've got to spend most of the time on your struggle, most of the time on your fears, most of the time on your apprehensions, most of the time you hesitated, most of the time you were about to give it up. You've got to spend some time on that. That's called identification and building a bridge. Then take them by the hand and then show them your success when it has meaning because it came from struggle, it came from decision, and it came maybe from heartbreak, and it came maybe from the same position the person finds themselves in that you're talking to. Identification, what makes you real? That's so important. Part of identification is proper word choice. Jesus said to his disciples one day, Today I'm going to teach you how to fish. What an important choice of words, fish. Who is he talking to? Fishermen. We call that brilliant. He didn't say, I'm going to teach you how to recruit. No. What do they know from recruit? These fishermen don't know recruit. And if you keep insisting on saying recruit to fishermen, we call you naive. You've got to change your vocabulary. He said, I now wish to teach you how to become fishermen. Now, see, they understood that language. He said, winning people is a lot like fishing. Now, see, they understood that story. If it's like fishing, we can figure it out. Here's the next clue to identification. Beware of using inside lingo on the outside world. Sometimes inside, some little catchy phrases become comfortable, but outside, they become strange. The man said to me, we've got to get into the Word. We've got to spend more time in the Word. I thought, how small would you have to be? Now, what I found out later he meant was, we should read the Bible more. Now, see, that would have made sense to me, right? But the end to the Word... We call that kind of strangey, strangey language. And you've got to be careful of strangey language on what we call the outside world. You've got to learn to shift gears. The lady said to me, I've learned how to handle my space. She said, how are you doing with your space? I thought, space, space, what's the space, space? Now, I found out later she'd been to the space seminars. And she learned the kind of spacey language, space, space. <laughs> But see, you've got to be careful. You talk space, space to a lot of people, and they go back like this. Say, space, space, space. What's this space, space? Right? 
Now, it, the people that have been through the space seminars can understand the spacey language. But if somebody hasn't, you've got to learn to what we call shift gears into an appropriate word choice depending on your audience. It's called the gift of language in a variety of awareness to learn how to choose the right words and the right phrases depending on who you're talking to. We call this awareness. We call this being non-lazy. We call this being sharp in perception to know who you're talking to and how to choose the words that'll make sense. Identification. You've got to identify with the sorrow by recalling your own sorrow. Identify with the joy by recalling your own joy. Identify with the difficulty by rehearsing your own difficulty. Here's one of the best clues in learning to better identify. Go back over your own life and make a study of your own life, your circumstances, your feelings, your awareness. Some of the stories you haven't told for a long time. Some of the experiences you've had. Now, sometimes when you freshly come from an experience, it isn't that easy to translate it and it isn't that easy to talk about it. But as the time passes and you can take a more thoughtful approach to your experiences, the key is not to lose the intensity of it but to become more educated in using the intensity of your experiences to weave into the next conversation and by the gift of language and emotion touch somebody's life reach somebody affect somebody persuade somebody identification very important subject here's the next part of a good presentation it's what we call logic and reason if you're trying to persuade a child, talk to a child or talk to an audience or if you're trying to talk to a customer. Part of any presentation is the logical part, the facts and the figures, and the numbers and the dimensions. And we won't linger too long here because here's my point on logic and reason. It's got to be brief. We need some facts, but only enough facts to start the decision making process. You got to beware not to cover too many facts. I'm sure we've all heard the expression, it's possible to talk somebody into buying, keep on talking, talk them out of buying. Here's where this problem usually occurs. Even if it's a child, you can talk a child into deciding, and then you keep on talking, talking, and then they undecide. We talk past, too much logic, too much reason. We need just enough logic and reason so that it starts to make sense, not so that you understand it all. If you walk into the new car showroom and express an interest in an automobile, Salesman comes along and uh, says, let me tell you about this car. You say, okay. He says, follow me. And he takes you out back into the shop. And he opens up the shop manual on the car and says, let's start with the left front wheel. You would say, hold it, hold it. He says, this is going to take a long time. We've got a thousand facts here to go through. You'd say, hold it, hold it. You don't need a thousand facts to decide about this automobile. How many facts do you need? About a half dozen. And if somebody makes the mistake of going beyond the half dozen, here's what they're going to do. Lose their audience. So you've got to make sure you don't get into too wide range of facts and logic. Because here's why. Most decisions are made emotionally. We need just enough logic so that it makes sense. But we're going to do it probably out of emotion. So the key is to be brief with logic, reasons, facts, because too much of anything is too much, right, at one time. What if you sat down to a steak dinner and you were real hungry so you, you cleaned it all up? What if they cleared that away and brought you another one? Well, let's say you're real hungry so you go for the second one. What if they cleared that away and brought you the third one? See, that third one doesn't look good. <laughs> In fact, if you start on it, you'll probably lose the whole thing, right? <laughs> I mean, too much is too much. So, brevity on logic.